Welcome to the second week of the machine learning course. The theme for this week is characterization of learning problems. As you know, this course has many weeks and we will gradually become more concrete regarding various algorithms and the application of those algorithms to specific problems. However, this week has the purpose to give you a general overview of machine learning and its varieties. Uh, also various situations and scenarios for use of machine learning and crucial issues to consider uh, in those uh, situations. So we will start discuss uh, one major distinction regarding the role of machine learning. So a lot of this course will be focused on what's called data analysis. This means analyzing large data sets to create abstractions. These abstractions can then be used for various purposes. The the second context, though, is what is termed here adaptive systems. And as you know, we, will, we are surrounded by more and more of autonomous systems of various kinds that do as services. And in general, these autonomous systems, in order to be useful, need to be adaptive. And of course, also here, machine learning has a growing role. The distinction between data analysis as such and use of machine learning in adaptive systems is still a useful distinction. It's still very relevant for sorting out and understanding various approaches to machine learning. But of course, the borderline between the two shiners tend to become increasingly blurred. 10, 20 years ago, it was a clear demarcation line between the areas, but it's not so today. And of course, in general, for data analysis, the ma major reason for all learning is to ultimately act better in future situations. So let's turn at first uh, to say something about machine learning in the context of adaptive systems. So there is one major paradigm in machine learning called reinforcement learning. You may have heard about it, and I'm sure you will hear about it more. Examples of the use of reinforcement learning are in the context of game playing, but also in the context of robots. That means uh, how to uh, adapt a robots so that the mo movements of the robot get more optimal. So there's a pretty abstract model of reinforcement learning uh, in the sense uh, that it's viewed uh, as an agent that acts in an environment. And the agents perform a series of acts uh, and the environment as it is supposed to react and give feedback based on those actions. And in this case, we term this kind of feedback uh, the reward. And of course, in the long run, the idea is that the series of actions uh, and the reward given from the environment to the agents is supposed to iteratively improve the functionality of the agent and in the long run create some kind of optimal uh, performance. Reward, of course, uh, is a general word. It can be negative, can be positive. So we can say reward can be credit or can be blame. Uh, of course, in any concrete application of this abstract model, it is assumed both that the environment in question is able to provide reward in a, in a concrete form. 
and that the agent, of course, is also able to internalize uh, this concrete reward and adapt the internal behavior of the system. Typically, um, uh, this kind of system has a number of internal parameters and what happens when the reward uh, is considered is that these parameters are uh, modified. But it could be, in general, any 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 change of the internal, internal structure of, of the agent that can take place in, in this context. So to continue um, a little about reinforcement learning, um, as I just said, uh, it's ab absolutely important that the agent can concisely manage the handling of the reward and, and as a consequence, update the, the internal uh, structure of, of, of the agent itself. Um, it is further assumed that the typical scenario for reinforcement learning is a strong theory-based hardware and software system. So we are not talking about here a system where we learn uh, in the absence of a theory. We rather learn in the presence of a very strong theory. So cons just conceive a robot. Uh, uh, normally a robot is a very advanced design. And if we use reinforcement learning just to optimize the, the movement of the arm, we can say that we, we actually, this kind of robot system learn uh, on the margin of, of its already existing uh, behavior. Uh, we will look into different kinds of ways of formalizing this later in the course. But I can already now say that one very, very common use, way of modeling the environment in this kind of case is using what's called the Markham decision process. And also then in turn, a very, very general uh, applied mathematical technique called dynamic programming. Uh, so these are very typical tools uh, in, in the toolbox of engineer in, in, in this respect. Uh, but as you will see later, reinforcement learning can be realized in many different shapes. So now I want to turn to data analysis and the first thing I want to do is to discuss with you a little about what I call the end-to-end -end process for application of machine learning to real-world problems. So as you see on this slide there is a long list of steps to consider and uh, rather far down the line in this list you find the core analysis phase. So many things I assume when we think about machine learning and its application, we talk about the core analysis phase where we have an algorithm and we apply that algorithm to a data set and then we get some output from that process. But as you see from the whole list, this is absolutely not the only thing. Uh, there are so many other steps needed in order to solve real problems. Um, and uh, of course, the first thing is to harvest the data. And for realistic application, it's absolutely not certain what the data are, what form it has. It can be data in very many forms from very many sources. And uh, potentially then there is a lot of work to harvest that from all these sources and bring it together. And then, of course, because the forms are different, uh, there need to be some pre-processing of this data. Uh, I mean, a typical case is when the input and the data is in the image form or, or, or like uh, just sound or something else. Then that has to be uh, transformed into a digital form that can be uh, reasonably easy used uh, for a machine learning algorithm. Uh, and then, of course, one also will consider whether we are learning 
uh, learning in, a, in the absence of a theory. More or less, we have a lot of data and we really don't have a theory. Or uh, the contrast is that we have a very strong theory. So what, as I said uh, earlier, reinforcement learning, we, we learn uh, on the margin of prior knowledge. Uh, Exactly where we put the border between machine learning and, and, and some other engineering skills is a little unclear. But I assume when we come to feature engineering, it, it's clearly with the realm of machine learning. And feature engineering is, of course, the skills that we will come back to that is needed to uh, express the data items or a data set uh, in in a form um, that is manageable for the algorithm. So, so, so given with the device and, and uh, fabricated uh, the right kind of data set, uh, we have to ha choose an algorithm that is suitable for the situation. But it's not normally not just to choose an algorithm because an algorithm is not a very seldom a black box. An algorithm can be adapted and should be adapted, probably in order to get a good, give a good performance. And uh, so, typically, one has to adjust the algorithms. One can talk here about hyperparameters of algorithm, language bias, complexity, uh, ma management issues. Uh, okay, so when then is all of this is done, then the core analysis can take place, but. When that phase happens, normally uh, there are more things to do because it's, it's not certainly so that the output from the application of the algorithm create data in the form that you require. So there is may be needed some post-processing. And finally, of course, in order for the result to be used either in a system directly, online updating, uh, you need to prepare uh, the form of the output. Uh, the other case is, of course, if you want to use it for decision making, you need to prepare material that are useful for uh, decision makers. So what we will do now is to um, slowly converge on the key topic of this week, which is classification. So one can say there are two main scenarios in data analysis. One important area which we actually will not spend so much time on is what in statistics is called regression. And regression is ex essentially to use the analysis of all states to establish a means of prognosis uh, for, for future states. And uh, in contrast to that classification is to look at uh, descriptions of objects uh, and abstract from those objects, trying to define concepts uh, or classes, so that the definition of those concepts can serve as a basis for classifying new objects in the future. So regression is about prognosis for states, and classification is about uh, the base for being able to classify uh, objects not seen so far. So saying a few words more about regression, being a st technique from statistics used to predict values of a target quantity when the target quantity is uh, typically continuous. And you see to the right uh, an example how it could look like a very simple example, which is a linear, uh, linear dependency between two numerical variables. And I mean, such variables, there are like millions of examples of, of that situation. So the numerical values could be uh, the length of person as a function 
of the person's age. It can be the price of a property at the, at uh, as a function of a point in time, and, and so on. But as you understand, I mean, this is just the simplest kind of example. Uh, many cases, you, you, a state can be something more complex. It can be a bundle of variables. It can be some structured um, uh, set of variables. And regression, of course, makes sense as a concept also for those more complex uh, cases. So from now on, we will focus mostly on classification, or as we will synonymously call it, concept learning. And uh, we will have four lectures more this week, uh, three lectures uh, on the key issues and uh, the fourth lecture uh, on the tutorial for, for the assignments. So the three lectures uh, of the first will be on objects, categories and features, um, primarily sort out the terminologies here because uh, it's, it's a pretty complicated situation and part of the difficulty of, 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 of uh, reading about this area is there are so many terms around, uh, often synonymous terms. Um, the second lecture we will talk about features and the role of, of feature engineering and finally in uh, lecture 2.4 we will turn again to what is here called scenarios for learning, where we will talk about a number of important distinctions, uh, such as supervised contra unsupervised learning, online versus offline, instance based versus abstraction based learning, uh, and so on. But before we leave this lecture, uh, when I'm going to introduce a simple example that will be referred to both in, in, in the lectures this week but maybe in, in forthcoming. So of course over the week we will, I will introduce a few examples uh, that uh, will be the base for various discussions. As you may remember from the first week, uh, something that exists at the moment is um, a growing set of um, repositories for uh, data sets of different kinds. Uh, many of them can be openly accessed, some are more restricted and, and, and so on. So what I, I have done here is I, I tried to select a reasonably limited data set from one of its repositories, the UCAML repository. And um, essentially the name of this data is the SU data set. I mean, uh, if you look at the whole repository, it has 351 data sets, some data sets with a huge number uh, of, of data. So my selection is just was very practical here. I, I, I need something, a simple example to use as a basis for some discussions. And um, so this is a very naive and partial classification of animals. And in, there are 107 objects or data items. Um, and they are each character, characterized by 18 features. 18 is not so small but not so large either uh, and essentially these uh, 107 objects are actually uh, categorized in pre-categorized labeled in seven uh, categories so that, that's uh, the example we will look at so for this uh, data set the zoo data set um, we have a class structure or category structure, uh, which is essentially, um, which is essentially focusing on the classification of animals on a certain level. So, so actually, this this whole data set starts from single examples 
of specific um, uh, specific kinds of animals and uh, the task is to uh, classify those in terms of seven categories which are all animals and the uh, chosen categories are mammal, bird, reptile, fish, amphibian, insect and invertebrate. Uh, that's how, how the data set is set up. So this means that every single data item in the data set is uh, labeled with one of these seven items. So next we come to the features in this data set. So uh, as you will soon see, every single data item is characterized uh, by uh, one of the all of these features. And most of these features are Boolean. So they are either 0 or 1. So an animal has hair or it has not hair. Uh, it is it has feathers or not feathers, it lays eggs, or so, so, so they are Boolean. Uh, the only exceptions are, the only, I would say, predictive uh, feature uh, that is not a Boolean is legs, because legs is an integer and tells how many legs that animal has. So, yeah, we will discuss uh, the engineering of features uh, in one of the later lectures. But um, you can see here, of course, that um, one issue that is important with the choice of features is that the features should be, feature set should be rich enough to cover all the seven categories. Uh, of animals that we are interested in, in classifying. If we choose too few features or choose the features uh, with some bias, it may be so that the feature set would be perfect to classify birds and useless to classify mammals and, and so on. Of course, if we want, could, uh, want to have hundreds and hundreds of features, it's not a problem because we could bring everything. But as you will see later, it, um, it's often desirable to keep the feature set uh, down. And then um, one have an issue of choosing the appropriate uh, features. Then there are two kinds of um, features here that are a little special because they they uh, they characterize uh, characterize or classify uh, the data item, and uh, the important one for the task is class type, which is then always one of these seven types. So all the data items are pre-classified and given a class type. But then, of course, you also have something here called an animal name, and that's essentially saying that. This animal is an ape, this is a horse, this is a dog, and so on. And actually, this uh, data set uh, only have one instance, only one data item with the same name. So there are not m several examples of dogs, not several examples of cats. It's a single, well-defined characterization of each of these kinds of animals on that conceptual level. So here you finally see the whole data set, all the 107 ob ob objects. Um, it's a kind of handy that we can one can show the whole data set on, on one slide. Um, as I said earlier, there is only one example of each animal on a kind of basic level. So it's one dog, one crab, and penguin and, and so on. There are no duplicates uh, of, um, of uh, animals on this level. And so uh, the data set as it is given uh, focus on a task where the analysis is from basic animal upwards towards anim animal. 
and uh, as we will discuss a little more later, of course, every domain has many, many levels. I mean, in zoology, a lot of people have spent years and years of finding the appropriate classification from the very lowest level to the highest level. Uh, and uh, it's not always relevant to discuss things on all levels. Normally, one will choose a level which is relevant for the problem at hand. And uh, this is then just an example of such a choice. So this is the end of, of this first lecture. And um, thanks so much for your attention. Um, I, I, I hope um, you start to get a feeling um, for, for the whole area now. Uh, and we will go into some more details. And what we will do on the next lecture, we will look a little more about the terminologies here. Uh, in particular, the terminologies for objects, categories, and uh, features uh, to sort out uh, what is what. <laughs>